All right, we're going to go ahead and get started this morning. If you don't mind, just a couple housekeeping things. Could you raise your hand in the GoToWebinar panel if you can hear me? Just want to make sure that I am audible for the audience. Once again, if you can use the hand icon in the GoToWebinar to inform me that you can hear me all right. Alrighty, so this morning we're going to be talking about Snapstream EDU and our distribution solutions for K-12 organizations. Uh, we've got a few handouts that I've listed in the panel here um, that go along with some of the slides that we're going to be reviewing. Uh, some documents on kind of workflows, pricing information, a case study with one of our customers, um, and just a uh, product overview in general. So this morning we're going to be talking about who we are, why we use video for morning announcements, uh, using TV content in your curriculum, an overview of Snapstream EDU. Uh, we'll go through a live demo on the interface just like your end users would in, in your local environment and then talk about uh, doing a proof of concept as well. So who we are, uh, we are a group of small, nimble, creative, uh, and hardworking individuals. Uh, we're, we're about a 30 person team based out of Houston, Texas, uh, with a few employees scattered remotely around the country. As you can see on this slide, we uh, work with a variety of different customers um, from small private schools to large public school districts, uh, higher education, as well as some other verticals, government, entertainment, um, and uh, other media outlets. So at a high level, we see that many schools are shifting away from the way that uh, information was communicated at campuses when I was going through school, uh, which was your your old, uh, you know, over the intercom setup um, to more of an interactive IP based uh, video distribution system or some type of video uh, based um, announcements in general. Um, Number one is most importantly, I would say, is it's a lot more engaging. Uh, it'll, it allows a lot more flexibility. Um, the students can feel much more a part of the operation, and it uh, keeps people in touch um, with the announcements, and you know breaks the mold of a monotonous uh, piece of the day. Uh, every time you know you're, you're you're getting your morning started it also builds useful skills uh, to the people that are involved and um, allows you to incorporate a lot more uh, content um, into the curriculum as far as TV in the classroom we always see we, we also see a push for this as well uh, so there's a lot of relevant content um, from some of the stations that are listed here, uh, your discoveries and history channels of the world. Um, also, many school systems uh, want to be able to make those current events available uh, to the classroom. A lot of news content or uh, relevant information doesn't always air during the school hours, which is why our platform allows you to watch both live content as well as record it and, and playback on demand. And the same goes for your internal content, uh, both live and in a recorded fashion. And we'll go over more of that shortly. Uh, and lastly, uh, foreign language classes. Obviously, there's no better way to uh, really get you know, immersed with the language than to uh, interact with, you know, uh, real world programming um, to, to deepen your um, 
efficiency and, and expertise uh, with those different languages. So before I go any further here, I'm actually going to launch a poll, a few polls this morning. Um, and one is just a, a pretty basic yes or no here. So if you can go ahead and take a minute to uh, answer this poll, you'll see that uh, it's launched here in the panel. And we'll close this here. So it looks like we've got about, you know, about a third of you that are doing, uh, that do have something right now, and about two thirds that do not, um, which is typically what we see um, when we ask that question. Um, so it, it's good to know what we're working with today. And so just a follow-up question to that. Um, based off of what you are doing, you know, what what is your workflow like? Um, if you have one at all, obviously. Great. So once again, that kind of lines up with the last question because uh, m the majority of folks are currently not doing anything, which is where Snapstream can come into play. All right, so let's talk about how Snapstream works at a higher level. Uh, we are a hardware slash software based solution, uh, meaning that you are purchasing physical hardware, which resides in your local environment. So on the, uh, on the current slide here, you see that you can take any number of different sources, whether it is a camera feed, a DVD player, or uh, various broadcast TV sources, if it's coax, um, cable or satellite set-top boxes, et cetera. And that's actually gonna be ingested into a Snapstream encoder. Um, the single channel encoder, which would take in uh, something like a, a camera feed is actually one of the documents I believe that I put in the handouts. And then that all gets distributed out through the Snapstream EDU server over your local network via either a unicast or a multicast stream. And the difference between those two is simply uh, bandwidth considerations. So with a multicast stream, uh, it is one stream regardless of the number of people accessing it. And then unicast is uh, the, you know, the two to four megabits, uh, let's just say times X number of people accessing that stream. So it's taking up a little bit more um, consumption on the network. Uh, multicast is only applicable to live content everything that is recorded is always going to be in a unicast fashion. And I'll show you the differences of what that looks like to the end user momentarily. I did forget to mention, uh, before I go any further, please do ask any and all questions. Uh, there is a section in here um, to, to ask questions or you're welcome to ask them off the record. Um, but the more you ask, um, the more I can, you know, cater the content uh, to what you guys are looking for and help clarify anything that I've gone over. So this is possibly one of the most important slides, as basic as it sounds. Uh, people use Snapstream EDU because it just works. Uh, teachers will actually use it. Um, administrators um, and technology folks will uh, be happy with it because it just it makes sense. It's intuitive. Um, it's very easy to uh, navigate and customize for uh, user permissions and credentials, um, etc. Uh, so many organizations have switched over to Snapstream because of this factor. Another important thing to point out is we are uh, we have HTML5 um, native support, meaning that 
our platform can be accessed on any type of device and any browser. So whether it's Chrome, Internet Explorer, or Firefox, whether it's a Chromebook, an iPad, or a PC, uh, we're very flexible across all of those different verticals. One thing you can do as well uh, is clip and share content um, to easily export it into different platforms that you use for curriculum um, or, or hosting you know, content outside of the Snapstream ecosystem. All of this will uh, be uh, more crystallized when we go to look at the actual interface. So as far as internal content, whether it's morning announcements or otherwise, it's, it's three simple steps. Uh, you're going to turn the camera on. That camera is going to uh, take the HDMI uh, out, um, typically, or potentially composite into that single channel encoder, which is the size of basically a set-top box. And uh, that set-top box is portable, so it can reside wherever you're doing your uh, broadcast. Um, and it can also be transported around the building. Um, it just has to be able to connect to the network in some way, and we'll send that stream back to the server wherever that's located. You can record the content um, and or uh, show it live. And then on the end user side, they're able to pull up that live stream in a seamless fashion and, uh, and watch it across any number of devices and locations. Another pillar to Snapstream is being able to upload content. Um, so all of our servers uh, come with at least some base level of storage. And so think of this as a digital repository of sorts. You can upload any sort of video assets, whether it is uh, content that you own in, in, the, in your own library, um, whether it's lessons that, that people are recording, professional development, um, concerts, uh, plays, what have you, can be stored in a centralized location on, uh, on Snapstream. And then we also have a Snapstream set-top box, which extends out the, uh, the viewing capability, typically to common areas where you have TV displays located. And you can take that Snapstream set-top box and connect it to the back of that display and either pull up live or recorded content via the remote um, at where, where the display is actually located or uh, it can be controlled from a centralized location. In other words, uh, a principal could be in their office and, you know, and, and specify to push content out to all those different displays. So I'm gonna stop for a second and see if there are any particular questions at this point. Uh, please don't be shy to ask them. Um, I've answered a few already, uh, just that, that were more specific uh, to people's individual use cases, but I'm sure if you're wondering something, other people are as well. Okay. So let's go ahead and jump into the product demo. And I do want to backtrack for a second here and start from the very beginning. So you see that I've opened a browser and I uh, happen to be using Chrome, um, but, but that part doesn't really matter. It's your browser of choice. Uh, and I have gone to a, uh, the name of my local server. So I am pointing to an appliance that's located here in our office, and it happens to be named SNAP EDU. Yours might be called, you know, uh, School TV 123 or whatever, you know, destination name it's given. 
but you're not going out to the internet anywhere. It's all being accessed on that server connected to your local network, um, which you know is is great for security and control of the of the content. So when you come into this interface, uh, and I'm I'm logged in as an admin, by the way. Um, so I'll show you how you can kind of scale back what can be viewed uh, based off of what individual is signed in within the organization. But you're most likely going to operate within two sections of this interface. Number one is the guide. So in this particular guide, uh, this is all real, you know, active content. Uh, I have about nine channels. Eight of those channels are traditional broadcast TV. And you see here that there's a bunch of red icons indicating that I'm using that DVR functionality to record the content as well as be able to jump in and watch it live. So I'm simply going to uh, right click. And you see that it gives me the following options. I can watch something live. I can record episodically a particular time period, or I can record everything on this channel. I want to watch live, though, right now. So I'm going to select this first option. And it's going to pull up a multicast stream, which is going to fire up VLC player. Um, that is the one thing that you would want to deploy if you went the multicast route on the different client devices. And it's a very seamless playback right here. So I'm watching live TV on my device, just like I would in my own living room. Likewise, if I go to my own internal content, it's literally a click of a button. And then I've pulled up my camera stream. This is looking out over downtown from our conference room. Uh, this mirroring uh, any sort of camera feed that you would have in your own environment, most likely with students or faculty members you know, talking into the camera. On the flip side, if it's recorded or if it is a, a unicast stream, it just plays back through this internal web player. So in terms of what the end user experiences, there really isn't much of a difference. Uh, like I said, it's just network considerations. So in the guide, uh, it's, it's one of two options, um, either watching live or recorded content. Anything that you choose to record in the guide lives over in the library section. In the library, you're building up your archive from scratch. And uh, so as you can see, I mentioned that we were recording most everything. So we've got a pretty robust archive in here. And I can jump in and choose to watch anything in a DVR-like fashion. Uh, you actually see that uh, I've got my video feed. And if you are using the TV side of the product, um, we also pull in closed captioning. So you can search for any needle in the haystack mention that you might be looking for. So if I'm searching um, for like State of the Union, uh, bad example here, because I got to go back to my library probably. It's going to give me results. And then when I click into that, it's going to take me straight into the point of the program where that was mentioned. In this case, it was mentioned, you know, nine different times, and I can clip out this content. So if there was something about Abraham Lincoln or um, global warming or whatever the case might be, I could extract that information. I could also be notified 
using the alerts section over here. So I could set up alerts and be notified anytime my organization was mentioned in the news or anything of relevance um, that I want delivered straight to my inbox. Uh, I can set that up as such and it'll it'll send me the uh, the relevant search results uh, at whatever frequency I choose. Back in the library, uh, here's the upload section that I had mentioned in the slide deck. So I can grab any sort of file that I want to, uh, upload it into the server. I can create any number of different folders. So let's say, you know, I've created my Mr. Jones folder. I want to take um, some type of video content, drop it in there, and then it resides over here, and I'm able to easily access that in the appropriate segmented manner. There is a YouTube tab up here. I uh, want to mention that two things about this. So number one, this is uh, it's a one-way street, meaning that you can take content from the Snapstream platform and push it out to a YouTube channel, but not the other way around. So we don't we don't do any direct integration with outside sources from the internet per se coming directly into Snapstream. If there was content from YouTube or another destination that you wanted to get into Snapstream, you would just need to download it and then upload it manually. But if you had um, some student production that you wanted to push out to YouTube, um, you know after the fact you could over here in admin provide authorization to uh, different accounts here and then you could directly post that out from Snapstream outbound. Speaking of uh, admin, under security, this is where all of your customization and configuration takes place. So you can uh, migrate uh, different Active Directory and LDAP credentials uh, to allow people to use their same login information uh, that they might already be using for other platforms. And then with those credentials, they would be tied to different groups. So there's about two to three dozen different functions that are possible on the system. And some of that could be enabled or disabled as you see fit. So if, if the DVR portion is not important to you, then that's totally fine. If creating clips of something is not important to you, et cetera, et cetera, or if there's just certain people that you don't want to be able to do that. As you can see, this particular group, most everything is disabled. So they would not know that that functionality is even possible. And if I sign back in as a different person, you see that my Outlook is different now. So I don't see anything about admin or alerts, etc. I only see what is needed for me as a seventh grade teacher or whatever the case may be. Using the uh, using your security settings and, and, and groups, you're able to uh, to to customize certain streams to only go to certain campuses. Um, so if there's you know if you have five, ten, fifteen different schools, and uh, some of that content is relevant to certain uh, entities and not relevant to others, 
then that's that that's fine as well. You can kind of point those streams to uh, to different locations. Um, so people's guides or people's you know uh, library, etc., uh, could could look different based off of whatever is needed. So that's a pretty high level overview. I do want to uh, go ahead and ask, um, I did mention about the proof of concept earlier. Um, so I'm just gonna put up this next poll question here. and see who would be interested in doing a proof of concept. Um, I'd kind of like to get with you and uh, talk in more detail about how that would look. Um, I believe I have, no, I guess I did not post it. That's okay, um, I'll, I'll, we can certainly follow up on that. with a few more details to clarify things here. And then piggybacking off of that, what does your time frame look like for something like this? Perfect. So my contact information is in the top right hand corner. Um, we, we work with all shapes and sizes as I mentioned at the beginning. Um, I'll be reaching out to, uh, to each of you to kind of discuss uh, further questions that you have. Um, the, I do see a question here. Uh, so in general, um, our software is, is specific to, our, our software and our hardware is specific to our um, what's the word I'm looking for, to our deployment. So, uh, you know, we get asked about other hardware and other software. Um, that was, that would be a question that I'd have to dive into a little bit more with you and most likely filter through our engineering department. Um, but in general, what we build is uh, proprietary. It's not, we're not using, you know, Dell, systems or anything like that it is is customly built for snapstream we don't physically build it there is a third party that builds it but um, they use it doing our specifications um, so it is designed uh, the hardware and software is designed to go hand in hand um, so the biggest thing to using other encoders is is step number one is it has to be an h.264 um, stream um, to be compatible with HTML5 so that you don't require any sort of plugins and that it has the most uh, seamless user experience. Um, great question. So the 15% annual service fee uh, covers basically everything associated with the product. So uh, we do about three to four software updates a year um, and any patches that are needed. Uh, it's a hardware warranty. Um, it is the uh, program guide data, um, the uh, um, all all training and maintenance um, on the system. Um, so depending on the deployment, uh, sometimes we go out on site uh, initially. Um, but uh, we're very hands on from a support standpoint. Um, so it's a uh, it, it covers essentially the support of the product from end to end. Um, we don't outsource anything. 
Um, so our technicians are, are all in-house and uh, are, are available pretty much all working hours that a K-12 organization would need them. Um, we work on call on Saturdays and Sundays, um, but uh, are, are readily available um, via phone and email um, the overwhelming majority of the time. What other questions are there? Uh, yeah, so uh, another good question. Um, so the, the short answer is yes. Uh, so when I, when I mentioned um, that the question has to do with, you know, what devices will it stream in? And that's, that's a big uh, question that comes up on a regular basis in, in EDU, um, which is why we, which is why the HTML5 thing is something that I emphasized. Um, so going back to multicast versus unicast, um, multicast pretty universally is only going to work on a PC or a laptop. Um, it uh, multicast by nature does not play nicely with the idea of wireless. However, um, unicast streams can play back on any sort of device, uh, whether it's your phone, whether it is a, um, a Chromebook, a uh, an iPad, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it, it should be able to play back on any type of device um, as a unicast stream. So in, in that sense, we are quite compatible across the board. So uh, let me actually, let me go to another diagram real quick to answer this other question. And I'm actually gonna go to our website. So if you can see this, uh, hopefully you can see this diagram okay here. Um, it's, it's, it's readily available on the EDU section of our website. Um, but I think it's a, it's a very good diagram. So uh, the question has to do with whether announcements would be live or whether they'd be recorded. And the answer is yes. <laughs> uh, so either or. Um, you can, in order to stream them live, you have this single channel encoder, which the, the source uh, gets fed into that encoder and then it goes back to this Snapstream EDU server and gets pushed out uh, to the end users. If it's recorded, if you're doing both, my suggestion is that you record it within the interface. You can also watch it live in the interface and then it's available in the library, which we looked at. If you're just doing it recorded, then you can take that file and upload it into the library for playback after the fact. So in summary, it can be live and it can be recorded as well. Um, most customers tend to do both because it offers the flexibility for those that didn't see it at you know that 815 moment uh, when it went to air. Are there other questions that I can answer? That's a great question. Um, you guys are just really on the money right now. So I'm gonna take these one at a time. Um, I've got a question about the broadcast TV uh, side of things. Um, so yes, it is completely legal to do this. Um, it, uh, many uh, school districts uh, are doing it. Um, it, uh, what it, what it comes down to is basically taking, uh, taking the feeds that 
you used to have cable drops and coax needing to be wired across all of the classrooms and all of the buildings of your organization, which is really an antiquated and, uh, you know, uh, thing of the past um, for a variety of reasons. One is technological, um, one is financial, um, and basically just scalability, people are not uh, people are not revising or are, are not uh, updating their buildings or building new buildings with the infrastructure that they used to because it just doesn't make any sense. So what happens as you see in the diagram here is you take your source in a centralized location and you uh, feed it into one of our encoders. So you see here that we actually have three different types of hardware. The server is a necessity. Without the server, you can't do anything. That's the brains of the product. Um, that's where their storage is, and that's also where the streaming gets uh, pushed out from. There is a, uh, a rack mountable um, four channel encoder. So these are the encoders that are used for the broadcast TV side of the product. Um, each of these can take in up to four feeds. So if you had, you know, 15 feeds or something uh, that you were distributing, you would need uh, four of these boxes clustered together, all feeding into the same interface. And so you take your source, whether it's uh, cable or satellite boxes, DTAs, an antenna feed, coax out of the wall, you ingest that into the encoder, usually in a centralized location, and then push that out over the network. You do need, whether it's a camera, a cable box, a coax, or anything else, you need one feed per channel that's displayed in the interface. So if you go back to the guide here for just a second, what I would need in order to have to mirror exactly what I'm doing right now is we're using eight different TV sources because I've got eight channels. So it might be like four from antenna or four from coax or something, four from cable boxes or, or whatever the numbers, you know, break down to. And then a camera feed with that single channel encoder. So to, to duplicate the deployment on this system that I've uh, demoed, you would have a, a uh, centralized server, you would have two four channel encoders, and you would have one single channel encoder for the internal content. So if you've got, if you're streaming content from all of your different buildings, then you need one of these single channel encoders to reside at each of those campuses, but you only need one server for the entire organization. Hopefully that answers that a little bit. The next question is about uh, plug straight into the encoder. Uh, yes. So essentially, if you have a mixer or if you have, you know, editing uh, software and things like that, think of, so the encoder is the ingest of whatever your end product is. So yes, you can use, you know, other production equipment and then that resulting feed is going to go into the encoder and then get distributed out. And as far as where you go to, to watch this, so back to my demo system here, I've opened a browser and they, they are going to a specific, specific destination, but it's not the internet. They are going to a named destination uh, based off of what the server is called. So if it's, um, you know, ABC, school TV, that's what they would go to. In my case, I'm going to snap edu. That's literally what I'm typing into my browser and then it's taking me to the Snapstream interface. So it would be specific to your organization and it would be talking to that local server.
Other questions? I'm not sure if this was a question. There was a, I'm not sure if there's a question about bandwidth or not. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think that's more of like a rhetorical question or statement that I'm getting. Um, but I, I did mention about, um, about multicast versus unicast. That's something that we could talk about. Um, it, uh, it's really a decision based off of your network configuration. Um, you, many people haven't ever used multicast before. It does require some configuration on your switches and such, uh, but that's the route that we recommend, obviously. Um, however, depending on the type of devices that you're planning to consume this on, uh, it really just depends um, on, on what would be right for you. Um, and, and last thing I'm gonna mention here is, People always ask me, well, what do you normally see uh, in terms of how it's, you know, how is it consumed in the classroom? So typically it goes from a teacher's device, uh, like a laptop or a desktop. Ideally, that's hardwired to a smart board or projector uh, and then consumed in that manner, uh, VGA or HDMI um, connected in that manner. Uh, if it is some sort of wireless device, it can still be streamed, um, but as I mentioned, it's going to have to be unicast, um, and uh, then it's just a, a little bit more of a hit to the network. So, yeah, re regarding regarding the, the TV, uh, that, that's an important aspect as well. So what you see here is a good example of what you deploy. In your, own in your own environment. So I've taken the liberty of deciding, like we have, granted, we have access to a lot in, in, our, uh, in our offices because we have a lot of different types of customers and we do a lot of testing and things like that. So um, let's say that you have access to 100 channels just for the sake of it. Um, the question is basically, can I limit what people can, you know, what, what feeds people have access to? Absolutely. So what you're doing is you're you're customizing the guide just like I've customized it here. So I've decided that I only want to make CBS, CNN, ESPN, History, National Geographic, Discovery, Science Channel, and Bloomberg available. If one of my users logs in and they want to watch MTV, there it's too bad. MTV is not an option that was customized in this guide. Now, if there is a request. Um, they would need to come to uh, the administrative level or whoever handles the system. And yes, the, the channels can be changed on, you know, a, an emergency or like a, a specified um, requested basis. Uh, but arbitrarily, end users cannot log in and just uh, decide to watch any channel that's available in the TV universe. Um, and the way that you would do that is we would work with you to configure your lineup exactly how you wanted. So we, we can access the program guide of any source, regardless of where you live and regardless of who your provider is. Um, so let's say my, you know, my zip code is 1002, and I know that, and then my source is over the air or my source is Spectrum or DirecTV or what, whatever the case might be, um, then we, we pick and choose um, to, to configure the lineup uh, and, and then this is what is shown in the interface to the end user. So I'd be happy to answer other questions kind of off the record here. I think we're gonna go ahead and wrap up this morning. I really appreciate everybody's time and hopefully uh, the, the Q&A session was very helpful. Uh, the slides that we went through as well as the product demonstration, I'll be getting in touch with each of you um, individually and I really look forward to hopefully working with you uh, in your school systems as we are with many other customers around the country. Thanks again and have a great rest of the day.